Welcome to the seventh in the series Ottomans Online, the Skeleta Center seminars on the Ottoman Empire and the early Turkish Republic. This talk will be given by Professor Selim Kuru, who is a professor in and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Washington, where he is also director of the Turkish and Ottoman Studies program. Professor Kuru's research focuses on Western Turkish literature and literary culture, and his interests include formulations of gender in Ottoman and modern Turkish literatures, literary circles, and literary competition in Anatolian Turkic city-states and the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> he has published widely on these topics, including two very recent articles on Enderun Rufazl. His talk today is on a queer cosmology, male Ottoman poets, and the power, power of poetry. Just before I hand over to Professor Kuru, the next talk in our series will be on Thursday, the 24th of June at 16.30 UK time and will be given by Professor Yavuz Kose from the University of Vienna. Professor Kose will be speaking on the Armeno-Turkish manuscripts and prints in the Mekitarist congregation in Vienna as a unique source for the intellectual and cultural history of the Ottoman Empire. I now hand over to Professor Kuru. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here in different time zones from different places. Um, this talk, uh, the title of the talk I would like to discuss after the talk. I hope there will be some questions. Uh, but this is uh, through the years that I have started working on Ottoman literature, I have been increasingly puzzled by the enormous number of gazelles uh, this form of poetry that I will talk about, uh, as else produced and recorded by Ottoman governing elite. Drawing on Walter Andrews' work, whom we lost last year on May 31st, I combine previous work uh, that I have presented elsewhere uh, on the topics of Gazelle's play and then the role of the content of Gazelle in the lives of Ottoman poets. This paper contains the material I'm working on for a chapter in the forthcoming edited volume by Didem Havlioğlu and Zeynep Uysal, a handbook of Turkish literature. This talk is about gazelle form and genre and interrogates the, its place in the lives of Ottoman men. And I would like to share with you two documents uh, at the beginning of the talk, a gazelle and a short quotation from a letter uh, and then uh, take up uh, a letter about how gazelle poems were perceived as a game, a serious and queering game. The poem I will recite now is composed by the 15th century poet Nejati. I am quite taken by this poem. I keep uh, reciting it wherever I go. Uh, according to a story, uh, when famous poet and high officer Ahmed Pasha received this poem in Bursa, in the late uh, 15th century, delivered by a caravan coming from Amasya, uh, Ahmed Pasha experienced a trance-like state and started dancing. I wonder if you will have the same experience when I recite this. I should add that uh, Nejati and Ahmed Pasha, uh, the poet Nejati, uh, whose poem I'm going to read to you, and Ahmed Pasha would be formulated as two style setters of Ottoman gazelle by the mid 16th century, like uh, half a decade after they passed away. Nejati's poems were commended for their surface simplicity with layers of hidden meaning and Ahmed Pasha's for technical perfection and a lofty imagery. I will read this gazelle in Turkish just to give you a sense of, uh, and I need to share my screen as well. Uh, for this. Uh, and you may follow the English translation on the screen. So I start. Çıkalı göklere ahum şereri döne döne, yandı kandili sipihrin cigeri döne döne, ayağı yer mi basar zülfüne berdar olanın, Sevku şevk ile virür canı seri döne döne. Şamı zülfünle gönül mısrı harab oldu diyü, sana iletti ki bu ter haberi döne döne. Kabe olmasa kapın, ay ile gün, leylü nehar, eylemezlerdi tavaf ol güzeri döne döne. 
sen olasın diye yer yer asılıp ayineler, gelene gidene eyler, nazarı döne döne, sen durup raksidesin, karşına ben boynum eğen, ine zülfün, koça sen simberi döne döne, ey necati, yaraşır mutri bir şeh meclisinin, rak surup o kısa bu şiir teri döne döne. This poem is not a love poem. But rather a poem about power of poetry and about a queer cosmology that can be experienced through this power, through experiencing composing forms and reading them. In this poem with the repeating rhyme element döne döne, dönmek, which may mean turning, returning, twisting, revolving, going round and round, Nejati conjures up the wonders of creation, a uh, core sign of which uh, are the celestial spheres that revolve around the earth. The poem starts with the spiraling sigh, ah, of the lover that was imagined like uh, giving out a smoke from the burning heart that carries sparkles, which reaches the sky and lights up the spheres, puts them into motion. And after this striking introduction in the first couplet, uh, the poem continues with different images of circular motion in each. And in the penultimate line, the poet proposes his poem for a sur surreal dance during which the silver body and the long dark hair of the dancer would intertwine, a beautiful evocation of the cycle of night and day, the circular time that fragile existence of humans on this earth submits to. While the poet submits in front of the dancer or the beauty of the created world, time, he claims the power of representation in the final couplet. The sigh in the first verse resonates with the fresh verses in the last verse, fresh verses that sets the gathering with the beloved into motion. The gathering uh, mentioned in the last verse picks up the, the rhythm of the poem and starts to move mirroring the celestial spheres. Why would this poem put Ahmed Pasha, a poet, but also a military judge into a trance and set him dancing? I want to mention a second verse. This one uh, defeats Mahmoud Abdul Baki, who is known with his pen name Baki, a late 16th century poet, also known as the Sultan of Poets. And the verse is by the Sultan of the empire, Suleiman the Magnificent who signed his poems as Muhibbi. In a letter addressed to Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, I want to put the uh, couplet on the screen for you. Uh, in a letter addressed to Sultan Suleiman the uh, Magnificent, Baki expressed his frustration as follows. If it is questioned why I have composed two parallel poems in response to one gazelle of yours, I would like to uh, remind you of the famous saying, the loser craves to play more. Trying to come up with a better response, I kept composing more verses. But how is it possible for a base person like me to compose a parallel to such a grand poem? It naturally ends up being a mere imitation, end of quote. And he only cites the second line of the verse on the screen, Eirilik also ajepmi kafiri mihrabda, as impossible to uh, surpass uh, line of poetry. The losing wrestler, uh, like I'm in Turkish, we have a saying, yenilen pehlivan oyuna doymazmış. So Baki refers to that. So the losing wrestler craves to wrestle more. Baki might have used the same that resembles Ghazal uh, writing to Oyun, a game, more literally than we might think. Formally, most Ghazals consist of five or seven rhyming couplets. Each hemistic accommodates up to 16 syllables according to the meter. It is a right, rather short yet highly rule-bound form. Ottoman poets wrote gazelles competitively when they appreciated a poem or when a poem presented a challenge for them or for many other reasons, they composed a poem mimicking the meter and rhyme of the other one in order to surpass it. 
Baki, a military judge who would later publish his poetry collection that will be uh, central to our understanding of Ottoman Gazelle, might have strived to write a parallel for the Sultan's poem to impress his patron. However, the letter points to a more intimate communication that was seen important enough to be preserved in the Topkapı Palace archives. It is not cited in any historical text. I consider Gazelle as a core literary form, which is an engine of Ottoman literature, that is Ottoman literary, historical, and bureaucratic writing. I will confine myself to the 16th century, the so-called classical age of the empire, and evaluate the form when it becomes a major yet subversive marker of Ottoman elite status. I argue that function of Gazelle experienced a transformation during the early 16th century in the Ottoman Empire, and further that it functioned as a vehicle to express a complex subordinate status that is provided by a queering cosmology for Ottoman elite. I call it a queer cosmology because that the cosmology brought about or manifested by the uh, gazelles and the gazelle genre, genre had a queering effect, especially on the members of a highly centralized administration, such as that of the Ottoman Empire. Starting with the mid 15th century, Ottoman sultans, viziers, bureaucrats, judges, scholars, financial administrators, provincial governors, janissary officers, those people who are defined as Ottoman governing elite or uh, the cool of the sultan, uh, growingly took part in a game that may be called gazelle play. Gazelle play as an enormous, enormous archive of Ottoman gazelle signify, signifies must have played an important part in the lives of these men. Just to give you an idea about the magnitude of gazelle production in the empire, one of the colossal parallel poetry anthologies that was composed in 1530 at the beginnings of this tradition of a Ottoman gazelle, not Anatolian, included 5,490 gazelles in Ottoman Turkish uh, from uh, around 300 poets. Suleiman the Magnificent Tent and the longest reigning Ottoman Sultan composed more than 3,000 gazelles according to the recent edition of his Divan. These numbers are enormous compared to other uh, traditions of poetry, uh, maybe similar or more. Uh, I don't do a count, but I, in my mind, there's sonnet, for example, is a similar form. How many sonnets are there? Uh, the gazelle play, like many serious games, transformed those who took, took part in it. Uh, it shaped and subverted the theater of the Ottoman court, thanks to a specialized nebulous imagery that implied what is impossible to tell directly. That is a story of creation by and separation from and the yearning to return to the divine. So three stages of gazelles, we can uh, compile gazelles expressing these three stages, creation, separation, yearning. Uh, in short, ultimate adventure of humans as codified by ages long Islamic mystical traditions, creation, separation, and yearning. Gazelle form functioned as the ultimate device to express this adventure in a repetitive fashion and to a degree of exhaustion of the intricate system of imagery it engendered. Gazelle became a growingly competitive play in the Ottoman Empire and it involved role play and the form definitely benefited from the centralized longevity of the empire. This is another thread of discussion I won't follow here uh, in comparing Ottoman gazelle to other traditions. Asked about uh, his favorite poem by Ashik Chelebi, the biographical dictionary of poets of whom is very famous, very uh, important. Uh, asked about his favorite poem, uh, this time Ali Hayali, a major poet of late, uh, like mid 16th century, uh, expressed his frustration in front of one of his favorite couplets by another scholar and judge of preceding generation, Isaac Chelebi. He says in his letter, as quoted by Arsh Chelebi, it's been years that I am drunk with the wine of envy that this couplet feeds me. Uh, and I get devastated by the wine of frustration whenever I attempted to compose a parallel to it. The couplet, that troubled Hayali so much for your interest is as follows. 
Gönül aynesi safidir ama temaşa bu ki bir sahip nazar yok. Now, uh, sorry, um, this wasn't supposed to happen. Mm. Isaac Çelebi was already dead at this time and hayali communicated this letter to uh, Aşık Çelebi and would not have any favors from Aşık Çelebi if we think that Baki might be just uh, bothering up Süleyman, but uh, here we don't have such a relationship. Uh, and uh, Hayali would not have any favors from Aşık Çelebi for revealing his favorite poem by uh, Isaac Çelebi. So this anecdote, in my opinion, definitely points out how obsessive Gazel play had become by the mid 16th century. People were getting really challenged by couplets for reasons we may not, in, which may not be clear for our modern gaze. The particular Gazel play that I focus in, focus in this paper was a part of the capacious and contentious theater of the Ottoman court. Uh, the members of the court might have had different educational, ethnic, religious, or social backgrounds. However, they submitted to the unifying rules of governance and ritual that defined it. For the elite, the court was the realm of work. And while the gazelle play was definitely a function of the court, it had no serious consequences for this ritualistic realm. Considering the inexplicably enormous number of gazelles that were recorded, material gain or professional goals cannot be the sole motivation, and there are not many, uh, behind gazelle writing and sharing. There were two other genres, major genres of, or forms of poetry, Kaside, the praise poems written for notables, and Mesnevi verse narratives to develop learned historical or amorous discourses that, brought, that might have brought Uh, financial gain to their authors. Unlike those composing gazelles, they don't have any direct bearing on the daily routines of sultans, scholars, judges, bureaucrats, etc. The lack of any particular motivation behind it makes gazelle writing seem like a purposeless, leisurely activity, maybe just practice piece, practicing rhetorical figures and imagery. But then why record and preserve those so systemic Why were they to signify the central importance of a poet uh, to be judged by his gazelles? The rules dictating its composition, communication, and reception, uh, like gazelles, were signified by the large parallel poetry anthologies, and that were also they, uh, they, uh, poetry anthologies that were also functional in the establishment of a strict Ottoman Turkish canon, and large biographical dictionaries that not only kept the reminiscences of famous poets, but also provided models for readers and contexts for particular gazelles. These literary tools transformed gazelle as a learned form, altering its oral <laughs> nature, which I haven't talked much about and making uh, and made gazelle more historical. In the 16th century, gazelle as play was being corrupted as it became an instrument of the fecund and decisive culture. This is a reference to a French theorician of uh, games. Uh, decisive culture of Ottoman elite. Uh, parallel poetry anthologies reflect the uh, heated competition among poets to surpass each other's gazelles, which as a common practice uh, restricted individuality in this very subjective form of I narratives. Writing parallel poems transformed gazelle into a rhetorical performance through which a performative eye is formed rather than being an expression of individual experience, maybe an expression of impossible desires uh, that are possible through assuming a collective eye, the content of gazelle, this creation, separation, yearning, constantly being resung. Within the Ottoman court game, gazelle play became a competitive, I keep repeating myself like a gazelle writer, a competitive game with strict rules that governed its form as well as its content. One of its distinguishing components was the player's pen name that was generally an adjective construct such as Sheikhi, Nejati, etc. Poets marked their gazelles by this chosen or given pen name. This pen name, which was called Mahlas in Ottoman contexts, Uh, help them appellate a persona as an appendix to their uh, Ottoman identity, courtly or scholarly or bureaucratic, 
So much so that in their poetry collections, courtly poets never included their full names. Their, this mahlas that appeared in the final couplet of Ghazal was the only marker that kept the players distinguishable in the game. Paradoxically, the mahlas was a mask for the individual poet, which erased their courtly name, the lover or real name. Rather, uh, the lower the subject of this competitive role play in Gazelle was nominally separated from the person, the Ottoman notable through uh, this pen name. While Gazelle may sound deceptively simplistic with respect to form, content wise, the rules were too ambiguous to define. In a sense, this contrast between the well defined formal rules of poetry and the essential, however loosely defined, content of the game enabled the competition to pass to last for centuries. With regards to the content matter, courtly gazelle piggybacked on, a par on particular forms of knowledge that can be gained through specialized theological, mythological, historical, and rhetorical training and learning. These converging knowledges established the distinction and through a realm of signification, those conjured up a cosmology that informed in a manner we may not be able to define yet the experiences of the elite. Intricately designed courtly rituals pronounced a sacred order that enchanted the realm of work, somewhat similar to the work realm of a lawyer or a doctor today that is mystified for the outsiders with its specialized vocabulary techniques, offices, and routines. Yet the court's aura was much restrictive and individuating. While the distinguishing specific set of knowledges were informing poetic forms and genres such as Mesnevi and Kaside, Gazel pushed the boundaries of poetics, teasing out the impossible to tell story of a cosmology that connected the Ottoman elite in another manner. This cosmology provided them a different subjectivity as a surplus of courtly realm. In the end, writing a praise poem for a partner like Patron may be uh, justified and contextualized better than a gazelle. But gazelle was defined by trans transgression. There is more than one argument behind this statement. In a gazelle, the poet appears as the rebel lover with his mahlas, the pen name, who re rebels against the mundane, repetitive, bland, and at times ambiguous forms of experience that was defined by first service at the court, second creed and religion, and third etiquette in social engagement. In short, gazelle is a poem that defies the courtliness because the lover represents himself as a crazy man who doesn't talk to anyone, who doesn't care for him himself, etc. Within growing the strict rules of gazelle play as a part of court game, there was found a response to the ideological underpinnings of the cool subject <coughs> status for the governing elite, of the governing elite. While Kaside's uh, object is the part, patron, the subject of the gaza, gazelle, the lover uh, uh, is the lover whose love defined the reflected the beloved's created beauty as a signification of the divine. Another aspect of gazelle play that made it so popular, I argue, was that it not only allowed members of the Ottoman elite to step out of the daily drudgery of work realm, but also provided them an instrument to rationalize their cool status by subverting their masculinity. The emasculated lover surrenders to the beauty of the beloved who combined the beauty and the wrath of the creator, Jalal and Jamal. The constantly crying rebel lover in size is emasculated, yet he is also empowered by a strong emotion of love that allowed him to disregard anything but uh, except for his love object. The beloved is the most beautiful and the cruelest object of desire. Uh, and lover and the beloved are the main pieces of the puzzle that was to be assembled for the gazelle play. Um, I need to skip a few bits, I think. After this general outline, um, like uh, in the end, Gazelle pushes aside service, creed, and etiquette, the main markers of Ottoman elite stat status as its content. By doing, while doing that, it becomes a part of all these. After this general outline of the Gazelle play, uh, with some implications of its place within the court game, 
I would like to focus a bit on the, its function that made it relevant for the Ottoman elite. The story of Gazelle was originally about mystical love. However, in the hands of Ottoman poets, Gazelle became a generator of imagery. It lost its mystical function because Gazelle was being produced in dervish lodges, etc. different forms of Gazelle than which I call courtly Gazelle uh, developed by uh, governing elite. Um, I won't dwell on this too much, but Latifi, a mid 16th century biographer of poets claimed that poets in his time were as many as flies claiming to be, who claimed to be the phoenix themselves. Latifi is the only Ottoman literary critic who strictly distinguished the courtly gazelle from mystical gazelle. He would burn the products of his own involvement in gazelle play as worthless artifacts compared to the true gazelle players of previous generations. Before starting his biographical dictionary that included biographies of over 300 Ottoman poets, Latifi described 13 Anatolian mystic poets who lived before the rise of Ottomans and who composed poetry in different languages. This is just to tell you, like there are different registers of Gazelle, not only registers of language, just to complicate our work further. Uh, in the theater of the court, Gazelle play lost its ritualistic function as a sacred performance that signified the later stages on the mystical path. Transmission and canonization, traces of which were preserved in the anthologies, etc., uh, that were composed in growingly bureaucratized and institutionalized courtly contexts, further defining an Ottoman identity as separate from even, uh, for example, poets calls them themselves poets of room, never Ottoman poets, but they were elite members of this governing of, uh, elite, uh, governing group, and they were Ottomans by uh, def definition growingly. Uh, this is a transformation I claim. The ecstatic song of the unseen sometimes gazelle called in a sense similar to the transition from icon painting to allegorical oil paintings transformed into a calculated image making contest. It also subverted by doing this because of the major content, the lower figure, the strong part patriarchal system that was centered around forms of masculinity, whereas a particular form of submissive masculinity came to be a heightened expression of uh, the poet's cool status in front of a lover as opposed to in front of a sultan. Uh, since the play involved expression of the joy of being the slave of life, a love for an enchanted world that constantly flowed through the face and body of the beloved that signifies the queer cosmology of the unseen. I don't know why I'm calling it queer still, but I like it. For Ottoman scholars, I must have a reason. For Ottoman scholars and bureaucrats of all ages, gazelle play was mostly a form of competitive keep repeating yours, a role play as they restricted the state of being the lover or speaking as the lover uh, to the difficult to reconstruct space of gazelle exchanges, going beyond the written archive of it and reconstruct, reimagine the processes of gazelle play orally exchange or written, being written, transmitted. Uh, for example, Ahmed Pasha, how did he hear about Nejati? Was it an oral composition or a written text? Uh, in the anecdote I mentioned at the beginning, gazelle play, composition and sharing of gazelles, it is very difficult to reconstruct that. Poets wrote more and more gazelles, almost like an addiction, transforming themselves from sultans, bureaucrats, scholars, or judges into base and lowly poet lovers who are constantly proud to be able to fall so low for love. Remarkably, this transformative power of gazelle play explained in pragmatic terms by Ayşe Çelebi in the introduction of his biographical dictionary of poets, which includes a very important discourse on poetry. He stated one of the aspects of poetry as alchemy, as it transformed uh, everyone from, uh, from sultans to beggars into lovers. Even though he didn't specify any form in his discourse on poetry, it was definitely Gazelle what was in his mind. In Gazelle play, the sultans, courtiers, and the learned competed with each other behind the mask of lover in order to gain the position of best lover. Gazelle can be taken as an addictive hobby. How am I doing with time? I have three more paragraphs. 
I'm fine. Gazelle can be taken as an addictive hobby, since, as I implied above, there are some pragmatic ends to this skill based game, the communication as equals in a courtly scheme through Gazelle behind the masks of the poets. Uh, is this, uh, uh, in this case, becoming an expert of a specialized language with the strict rules of establishing one image in one couplet and then setting together five to seven with monorhyme and in a meter. The player did not aim to resolve, but to complicate the linguistic associations to exalt metaphors in order to implicate the invisible, inexplicable, unknowable, unreachable by constructing a paradoxical puzzle. The story remained, however much innumerable gazelles are composed to tell it in the form of a beautiful implication and in fragments. The learned readers of gazelle was to be surprised by the puzzle that each couplet veiled. The blinding light of the unwitnessable within was veiled by the darkness of visible letters that formed words to be run to the task of conveying multiplying meaning so much so that all meaning ended in a heightened metaphor. Ottoman Gazelle was meant to be composed to tease, provoke, instigate others. Uh, and this was being done male Ottoman governing elite. This maleness here uh, invited sometimes women poets to take part in it and created complaints by them for not being able to fit or not being accept, accepted to be fit for this game. In the Ottoman case, there are very few women poets whose work remain to us. There may be many, but recorded. Genre of gazelle needs to be located within the wider context of Anatolian Turkish poetics. Instead of talking about sacred origins of gazelle genre, I discussed how it transformed into an object of a competitive role-playing game. Gazel was not individualistic, but rather a subjective eye narrative. And there was only one role to play in this game, the lover, which pointed to an emasculated cool subject. Drawing on these, I argue that for Ottoman learned elite, the joys of composing gazelles was similar to running marathons with respect to the training and performance. However, it differed with respect to the transgression, transgressions it allowed for the player, the discourse on transgression. So as Baki stated, Gazelle fashioned a game in which losing encouraged to strive for more. And it may be argued that in Gazelle play, winning was never possible. There were no boundaries for establishing linguistic associations related to the core narrative of creation by separation from and yearning for the divine. Ottoman learned elite at play with words were able to deny submission to their courtly world through gazelle, while Ottoman high officers, sultans, viziers, judges, scholars, etc., asked for suffering, expressed desire for annihilation, and shed bloody tears in their gazelles, they were composing ambiguous, multi layered images that made the created world as a more interesting place, where natural or man made objects play the game of mirrors to signify an invisible and unknowable world and constantly incomplete story. This unknowable world established a cosmology that was being experienced by composing gazelles through communication synchronically with fellow poets from various ranks and diachronically with distant past poets who might have composed in other languages as well. Like a stream flows backwards and sideways, expands like celestial spheres, gazelles sang a queer realm into existence in which taverns are mosques, beloved's eyebrows are altars to pray towards, and pious believers are hypocrites. Thank you. <laughs>